Good morning, class. Good morning. My name is Pam Turner, and I'll be the moderator for this morning's lecture. And welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school, not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States and certain other foreign countries. The Tampa branch was established in 1996. At this time, I would like to introduce you the Dean of the Tampa branch, Dr. Joel Turner, and our president, Dr. Cynthia Smith. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles, not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, Greek, nor Latin languages have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death, therefore making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form bright within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, the self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title can be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai, and he showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The ten primary constitutional aims and objectives of the Institute are as follows. 
First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered under the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. This morning we'll have class dedicated in prayer by Carol Miller. And we will have, a, are we having a musical selection? Yeah, uh, Tampa Choir musical selection. <coughs> and our scripture reading will be read by Dr. Sherry Williams, which is Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. And I wanted to remind everybody to silence electronics, which I haven't done yet. Okay. Class, let's bow our hearts and minds. And thank Yahshua once again for bringing the brethren together um, to, and our main goal being here is to keep our focus on you. That's our prayer to you is that we can keep our focus on what we're supposed to be focusing on instead of um, the calamity out there in the outside world and the carnality and coming in here helps us to just be quiet and, and have two hours of rest and peace and that's what we continue to pray for that we always have a seat to come in to do that with that I'll just say hallelujah hallelujah I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trainer of the Scripture Research Association Incorporated, reprinted by Yahshua Promotions. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of their, your altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their shrines by the green trees upon the high hills. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I give thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Thus saith Yahweh, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from Yahweh. For he shall be like the tree in the desert, and shall not feel when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Yahweh, and whose hope Yahweh is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
I, Yahweh, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on eggs, which she hath not laid, so he that getteth riches, and not by right, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Yahweh, thou hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from thee shall be written in the earth. Because they have forsaken Yahweh, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Yahweh, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of Yahweh? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me, thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil, and destroy them with double destruction. Thus saith Yahweh unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. And say unto them, Hear ye the word of Yahweh, ye kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. Thus saith Yahweh, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth the burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do you any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith Yahweh, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein, then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes, sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes and men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin and from the plain and from the mountains and from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices and meal offerings and incense and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the house of Yahweh. But if ye will not hearken unto me, to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. That was Jer Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. Our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Amber Marshall. Thank you. You're, you're going to pass? Okay. You want me to go on to the next one? Mm -hmm. All right. And our, our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Judith Turner. Hold this yeah, this? I'll just hold okay. it. All right. All right um, I don't have all that much on my mind either. Um, this is a very interesting scripture, um, but I'm not in a position to work with it just yet. I usually sit there and ruminate over it for a while. So, um, so why don't we just go ahead and... Um, 
Get me um, John, the eighth chapter. And I see where I'm going to go with this. Um, I just at school got done, I mean, and I'm obviously, you know, the things and the events that happen in our life, um, I like to try to think that um, all our steps are ordered, and it's in the scripture, are really ordered by Yahweh. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have to make decisions, and we do, we have to make decisions that are very difficult, that are heart-shatteringly difficult at times. Um, but, you know, you've been put into a place where you've had to do that. And um, you know, and you know, every time that I am put into anything, like even um, stop that and let's go get um, Hebrews, like the 13th chapter, the very last chapter, or where you're entertaining angels unaware. And I think that, no, let, I'm sorry, we'll get that one, and then I want the Great Commission. That I want. I'm sorry, I'm not used to getting up first. Like I said, there's a benefit to sitting in the seat. There truly is. Whatever is said from the floor, the scripture reading, I'm always, always, always trying to work with it as I'm sitting there, as the, as the speaker's up on the floor. That, that's just the way my brain works. It's always worked that way. Yep. Hebrews 13, 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Keep going. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Okay, so, you know, it's talking about, you know, don't worry about entertaining angels unaware, because, you know, um, uh, you know, they're, they're there. They really are. And sometimes they kind of let yourself, they let it, themselves be known just a little bit. And you just never know what in shape and form, like I talked about the last time I was up, your salvation is. Mm -hmm. For um, uh, Jonah, his salvation was a great big stinking fish. All right? And he, he had no idea, you know. And just reading that the last time, I mean, he literally was floating down, down, down to the ground, okay, and then that fish swallowed him up. There's a timing there that I never, ever considered. So he knew when he was swallowed up by that fish and he didn't have to take all that water into his lungs and drowned, that he was saved, okay? Did he understand the, the shape of his salvation? He couldn't even get outside of that fish to see what the fish looked like, all right? Just like Whatever, I, I don't want to go there. I want to go someplace else. I want the Great Commission, Matthew, the 27th chapter, wherever it is, 28th chapter. You know, and in, in that where Paul's talking in Hebrews there, it's also talking about the body. You know, and when one body part hurts, you know, it really does affect the whole body. It really does. Matthew 28 and 18. Uh-huh. And Yahshua came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Okay, and this is after his death, burial, and resurrection. All right? So he resurrected from death, hell, and the grave. So he has a right to say this, that all power has, was given unto me from heaven and earth. So he has power over this whole creation. And we sometimes lose sight of that. All right? Because of all the... Um, things that we personally cannot control. All right? Go ahead. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go ye therefore and teach all nations about yourselves, about Yahshua, about the Father, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
and this is what I want. What does he say at the very end? Teaching them to observe all things uh -huh. whatsoever I have commanded you. Right. And lo, I am with you always. Now, has Yahshua ever lied? He said, lo, I am with you always, no matter what. And I started out, you know, and I always try, no matter what situation I'm in, I try to look for Yahshua. I really do. And this one, um, I teach, I, I've decided to stop, you know, I, I go through all of these different units. I teach about the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, whatever, and then I get to the um, Hindu faith and, and India, the Indian population over there in India, the country of, and I, you know, teach Buddhism because Buddhism is an offshoot out of um, Hinduism, took more root and control in uh, China than it did in India. And usually nine times out of ten, people have, parents now, have no problem whatsoever with all those dead religions. That is the Egyptians, the Greek mythology. In fact, my gosh, there's like movies. And Rick Riordan is now, a, you know, it's like, I want to be Rick Riordan. He's a multimillionaire now. And he just, all, that's what he does is he takes like all these mythological creations of mankind trying to describe their creation but without a knowledge of Yahweh they go about to what establish their own righteousness right so but when I used to start teaching Buddhism and Hinduism okay and oh ho, ho, lo and behold Islam I would get complaints like you wouldn't believe from parents because those are the religions that have survived into modern times Okay, and it's a very tricky thing. I've pretty much perfected the art of teaching religion to these kids so that I, I, I really don't get it that much anymore. But um, I have this big religion project at the very end of the year where they have to, and I make them select a religion that is not theirs. Okay, so if you're Christianity, you got Islam. Just to show them that really, once you really dive into those different religions, Okay, and I understand you guys uh, studied it a little bit. There's really a very commonality in all of them. Okay, there's a common thread that goes all the way through. And nine times out of ten, I get all of these students, a lot of them will say, I really enjoyed this. Okay, but anyway, one of the religions is Judaism. Okay, and I have a hard time, well, because, you know, I'm not there to preach. I'm there to, to teach them about these different cultures, okay, or introduce them to these different cultures, if you will. All right, but this last time, um, I was just kind of having a really kind of a rough day mentally, right? I was just not wanting to be there at school. It's toward the end of the year. I'm mm -hmm. thankful that tomorrow is my last mm -hmm. teaching day. Oh, oh, yeah, then it's semester exams. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> you know, and some days, I mean, people, Unless you're a teacher, you don't understand what we go through. You just don't, okay? Um, and I was just really kind of having a, you know, kind of a rough day thinking, I, this has got to be my last year. I don't think I can do this anymore. <laughs> all right? But then, you know, I had them at the very end. They did all did their posters, and then I had them taped all around my room. And then the students had to go around, and I had this chart that they had to fill in so that they could see that every religion has its own little holy book every religion has its founder every religion has a system of belief and those systems of beliefs and what you do okay because it's all about doing in these other religions it's what you got to do okay and you know there's a lot of different you know the 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 four whatever oh no i'm it's, what I don't know, the five pillars for, you know, where you have to make a pilgrimage and, you know, you have to make a pilgrimage in the Catholic Church too and, you know, all that stuff. I'm thinking of the four divine truths um, in Buddhism, okay, and the eightfold path, okay. So the eightfold path is a path that you need to take in order to get to your nirvana, and reincarnation, that kind of thing. Anyway, so they're going around and they're filling out their chart for all the different religions. And all of a sudden, I hear them get to this Judea's chart and I hear Yahweh. And they said it just as crystal clear and clean. And I didn't, I, I have a teacher edition of my book and I went back there and I looked for Yahweh in the book and it wasn't there. Then I looked at the copyright and because I have, 
I have used books. I don't get the nice five-year replenish plan, and I don't even know how many schools actually do that anymore. No, I, I had to go onto Amazon and, and grab my books. So I have books from all different years, okay? So my teacher edition is, is 2012. And then I went to the chart that had that name Yahweh on there, and I looked in the 2005 edition, and it was right in there. And the later on editions, they probably got complaints, all right? So they took it back out of there. But it was my little gift for that day, just to hear all these students go to this one chart and it's clear as crystal as day, right? That, it, that oh, the name of the Jew Jewish God is Yahweh. And I just, you know, to me, that was my little present from my little angel, if you will, all right? Because I couldn't teach that, all right? There was one year, a couple years ago, where everybody, a student raises a hand and says, you know, all these other religions have names of God. Why doesn't God have a name? Huh? And I was like, and so then I could do it, you know, then I could do it, all right? Um, but, you know, I guess that's just for, like, my own testimony of encouragement, we all have these little signs, okay, that, lo, I am with you always. I remember when my dad had open-heart surgery, okay, and um, we, my brother and I, and my mother, we had to wait in the waiting room for like 20 hours or whatever. It was just a really long time. And um, when we finally got the chance to go into the hospital room to see him, they had him laying on top of a lamb's fleece. Mm -hmm. And that was my little sign mm -hmm. that, lo, I am with you always. When my um, sister's son, died in a car accident and I had to go home, obviously, you know, to um, attend the funeral and everything. Um, it was obviously a very, very difficult time for my whole family. And, um, you know, my sister and I sat down and, um, well, she turned to me and she asked me, well, what scripture do you, do you think I should get to read? And I said, well, one of the better ones I can think of would be um, Romans, the eighth chapter. So why don't we go, and this has actually gotten quite a lot in, at funerals. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it has the same theme of, lo, I am with you always. I think it's Romans, the eighth chapter. Yeah, um, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, let's pick it up at 28. That's, that's good. Romans 8 and 28. Mm -hmm. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love Yahweh. All right. So, you know, and sometimes he's saying all things. That's just not some things. He's saying all things, that all things work to the good to them that love Yahweh. Yes. All right. To Go them. ahead. To them who are the called according to his purpose. And um, whether you believe it or not, you've all been called down here. Okay? You've all been called down here. All right, go ahead. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Absolutely. To be conformed to the image of his son. I, I'm, I'm sorry. And I, I do because it's like, you know, like, just coming into this class, it was a one, two, three for me. I started out in Mad Town, Wisconsin, Madison, and it was a mad town. I went to an inter, inter uh, intermediate position in Oshkosh. And then, you know, it's not an unusual thing, or, uh, and we don't think of Green Bay as being all that green now, do we? But it's called Green Bay for a reason because the Native American people there loved it so much and they called it Green Bay, just like here in Tampa Bay. It's the Bay of the Healing Spirit. The Native Americans named it, not Tampa Bay, but whatever their Indian name was, it meant Healing Spirit, all right? So it went from, I went to, and there was a class, and the very first class in Wisconsin had to be in Green Bay, all right? Because green is obviously a sign of life. 
Um, this is just a little smorgasbord, and that's because all the plants, that's the color of the spectrum that they give off, all right? What they use uh, of the light, okay, is of the spectrum, is the purple and the red, or not the, the blue and the red. And we know the mixing of the, our, our, you know, purple, all right? So we've got these blue, purple, and scarlet veils in here. So every, I don't even look at a green plant anymore the same way as I used to because I know that behind the scenes, behind the veil, it's following the pattern. All right. Um, so anyway, keep going. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Uh-huh. 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Uh-huh. And whom he called, them he also justified. Okay, you know, and that's a really pretty thing there, too. Mm -hmm. He justified. If you are justified, are you in error in some fashion? Think about it. If you have to be justified, okay, that means that you are not necessarily worthy, save the man or the, the being or whatever that justifies you, all right? So I'm sorry, guys, you are stuck with me, you know, um, and all my silliness, all right? And if you got a good, take a good look inside yourself, yeah, I'm stuck with you too with all your silliness, yeah? So, <laughs> go ahead. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Right. What shall we then say to these things? If Yahweh is for us, who can be against us? Uh huh. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Right. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of Yahweh's elect? It is Yahweh that justifies. Who shall lay anything to the charge of, of the elect? You know, and sometimes people take that and they run with it. All right. Well, you better watch out because, you know, Yahweh also can smack you down because, you know, whatever, you know, you know, he will not spare the rod if you need the rod. All right. Go ahead. Who is he that condemns? Uh -huh. It is the Messiah that died, yes, rather, that is risen again who is even at the right hand of Yahweh, right. who also makes intercession for us. Uh -huh. Who shall separate us from the love of the Messiah? Who is going to separate us from the love of the Messiah? Okay, and go ahead. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Right, and it, it, it's not comfortable, let me tell you. To be counted as sheep for the it's not comfortable at all. Go ahead. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Uh-huh. Through him that loved us. Not to, of ourselves, but through him that loved us. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And then my sister at the, asked me to go up and, and say this. You know, she asked me what scripture to get, and then she asked me to be the scripture reader. So I had to go up in front of all of these Catholic people and otherwise, and this is what I read. Go ahead. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us. Nor height, nor death nor every, any other creature, none. Read that again. I mean, and this is the point, and I said it as emphatically from that podium as I'm saying it right now. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. And this is Paul, and look at what he had to go through. Mm -hmm. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present. Nor, nor things, things to come. Nor height, nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Yahweh, uh -huh. which is in the Messiah, Yahshua, mm -hmm. our Savior. Ever be able to separate us from that? None. Okay? And when the whole Mass was all over, the priest comes up to me and thanks me for my reading. Mm -hmm. He put his hand on me mm -hmm. and he went like this. Because if you ever go to a Catholic Mass... 
how do they read? They read like this. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's very monotone, okay? They don't read to understand. They read just to read. They're just words to them, you know? And whenever I'm trying to read, we have a scripture, I, I go back and I try to understand exactly what's being said, all right? So anyway, we, go, we get back to the house and we're sitting there and, you know, we're talking and all this other stuff. And my brother-in-law, who's not necessarily um, very religious at all, turns to me. He goes, Judy, that was powerful. All right. And then we started talking about the last moments of uh, Nick's life. All right. And um, basically, my sister was sitting, standing by his bed and she was telling him that it was okay to go. That's really common because, you know, they can hear you, believe it or not. You know, and he, she was saying it was okay to go. Now I have to back up just a little bit, okay? When Dr. Kinley, and I've only had this reported now because I had to rely on other people that were actually there, but when Dr. Kinley took off the flesh, the people that were present was Mary Gross, all right? And I did ask Mary Gross at one point when I went out to visit her, and um, Dr. Harris and one other person, I don't remember who that was, okay, but those two were definitely there. And when he took his last breath out of his throat, okay, supposedly a smoke came out, all right? Now look at, you know, the throat in the body or the neck in the body, okay, that is like the, the veil between the holy place and the most holy place, okay? And there was a smoke that came out and supposedly the words that were spelled out in that smoke was peace, okay? Now, my sister, she's sitting here talking, and I started this whole, like, little testimony about the fact that, lo, I am with you always, no matter what. And I, I do this all the time. I try to, okay, okay, where are you? Because I can't get through this all by myself. I can't get through it at all. Okay, so where are you? And uh, my sister started talking about the fact that she saw a smoke come out of Nick's neck. And I tried to tell my sister, you know, because it blew me away, you know, but she would have nothing of it because, you know, it's like, you don't understand. You guys have been called, and some people just are not called yet. I mean, that's, that's a hope. Yet. Okay. And it just blew me away. Lo, I am with you always. Now, I want to go to John, uh, and I have other things, but, you know, I do that all the time. And my most recent one was the kids, and they had no problem saying that name, you know. And we've had people run out the door <laughs> because they heard the name. Okay, and they, had no, and they would say, oh, it's Yahweh. Oh, it's Yahweh. And I, I can't believe how many times I heard Yahweh that day. It was great. Um, but go to John um, 8 and 32, and you might have to pick it up a little bit. As I've been thinking about this, too, um, all of a sudden in my mind, you know, we always talk about, you know, being kind to our fellow man and all that stuff and this kind of stuff. And then I started thinking in my mind, the phrase, and I'm sure you've heard it, kill them with kindness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I started, you know, we always think about that's what we need to do. We need to kill people with kindness, be overly kind mm -hmm. to people. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying to be mean with people, all right, but the most, I started thinking about all these preachers out here, okay, and all, all these religions out here. And I had a, a missionary come into school. He goes to, you know, to Africa and all this other stuff um, because my school-wide book this year was A Long Walk to Water, which was about the uh, civil war in Uganda. Not Uganda. Um, Somalia. Not Somalia. That's Sudan. destitute Sudan, South Sudan. Very good. Thank you. All right. And he traveled in there and... and, and preaches and, and does all this other stuff and he was the grandfather of one of my students so I asked him to come to our symposium he couldn't come that day 
but he came just before, okay, and he talked about, and he had a slideshow and all this other stuff, and he was very kind, all right, he talked about a story about a boy that got, you know, really burnt because he fell into the fire, and he, he came, and nobody could help this boy, it's a whole long story, so he calls his missionary people back in the States, and within hours, he had a burn kit that he could help this, you know, it was a kind act, and there's kind acts going on all the time, all right? And I really am starting to think about that phrase, kill him with kindness. Do we really want to kill anybody? Think about it. Whether it's a kind killing or a mean killing, do we want to kill anybody? Okay, is that the purpose to be, uh, for being kind? I, mean, I just started thinking about this, you know, because I have somebody else that I'm thinking about, and it's like, it's almost, there's too many thank yous being said. And I'm going like, would you please stop saying thank you? Uh, I'm sorry, but I mean, I, and that's what made me start thinking about it, you know. Um, did you get that for me? Yes. John 8, and just pick it up at 31. Then said Yahshua to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Uh -huh. And ye See, I guess, you know, and I don't, the last thing I want to do, I want to talk about the gospel. I don't want to talk about people. That's not what we're down here for, to talk about people. All right? Um, but, you know, just being in the, the environment that I am in at school, there is an administrator now. And it's almost like a competition now of who can be kinder to who. Mm -hmm. who, can, uh, who can have the best birthday gifts than others. I mean, it literally has become a competition. Because I'm sitting back and I'm watching it all and I'm thinking, oh my, you know. And that's not what this gospel is about, okay? It's not about killing with any type of a weapon, okay? Go ahead. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. All right? And he's saying this in John, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's why he says you shall know the truth. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, we, we know the story of um, Peter. He denies Yahshua three times before he gets up on the cross. Okay? And he still disclosed a lot of things to them before that whole experience, right? Mm -hmm. So he, here he's saying, you shall know the truth, okay? And who is the truth anyway? Mm -hmm. The truth is Yahshua, because in the 14th chapter he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light, okay? Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, this is like us right here. You know, we've got this narrow is the way that leads unto salvation, all right? And wide is the gate that leads unto destruction. Okay? Um, so after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that's when um, Peter gets up and he talks to um, people, I mean, 3,000 people or so at a time. Okay? And the truth that he understood is that Yahshua is real. And that is what makes all of us free that this is the truth. Now, do you feel very free, honestly, in this creation? If I wanted to feel free from a manifestational standpoint, I would not have to get up and go to work, okay? <laughs> that, to me, would be freedom in this creation. I could just tend it to my, <clears throat> my garden all I wanted, all right? So, he has made us free in this regard, okay? We are free from people guilting us into worshiping something that is not true. Nobody can't, they can't do that to you anymore, all right? I used to be told when I was growing up that I, if I did not go to church on Sunday, it would be a sin. So I was guilted into going to church each and every Sunday. Okay? I was guilted into going to, you know, catechism. 
all right? The truth had, that has made you free is that nobody can do that to you anymore, all right? Yahshua is outpouring the Holy Spirit, and it has made you free from all your theories, all your <laughs> concepts, and all your opinions. But as long as we are in this creation, okay, it is not going to make us free. All right? And it may be a simple little concept to consider, but really... I kept, like, when I wake up in the morning, it's like, please, I don't want to go to work anymore, okay? <laughs> I don't want to put on my shoes and my clothes and go to work and face 110 snotty-nosed 12-year-olds, okay? They're cool kids. They really are. But, um, you know, it just, uh, you know, but that, that's not the freedom that he's talking about, Okay you are actually understanding how this whole creation operates. You're understanding how he set it up right and purposed it right within the cloud, and you can see it operating down through thousands of years of time, unerringly, okay? And I will end with this, because I always like this scripture too. I want to go to Colossians, the second chapter, and I want you to start with um, 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 right where he says um, he is the head. I don't know if that, it's, that's in there, but I do want Colossians, the second chapter. But I want to start up a little bit. Colossians 2 and 8. Beware lest any man spoils you through philosophy and vain deceit. I guess that's what I'm talking about. You know, you can't, if the, the truth has made you free, that will not happen. All right? It's not that they're not going to try. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to make the cupcakes for the birthday person I, I bought. But I'm just, I'm thinking, you know, it's like they're buying presents now and it used to be just you know one person made a cake for somebody because she loved to bake that person's no longer there so we took up the helm and now all of a sudden it's like each consecutive birthday it's gotten more elaborate go ahead i'll pick it back up beware lest any man spoils you through philosophy and vain deceit uh -huh. after the, the tradition of men see and that going to church on Sunday, that's a tradition of mankind. Mm -hmm. And the way, you know, and they, they're all steeped in tradition. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. After the rudiments of the world and not after the Messiah. Mm -hmm. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right. And you are complete in him. See, we're complete in Yahshua and the Messiah. And that's what makes us free. All right. Even though sometimes it just doesn't feel like it. Mm -hmm. And he knows that too. Because we aren't. We don't have necessarily our clothes from, clothes from heaven yet, if you will. You know, I'm thinking of, of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, for we know that once we take off this earthly tabernacle, we will have clothes from heaven, all right? You know, we will never, ever be naked. Lo, I am with you always. Keep going. I'll pick it back up. And you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, uh -huh. in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, right. in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of the Messiah, right. buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of the Okay, Messiah. so buried with him in baptism. You know, we talk about this a lot, okay? When he went up to John... To be baptized, he took all our sins upon him, okay? And he, read that next section. Who has raised him from the dead. Uh, no, keep, read it up again, I'm sorry. Uh, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of Yahweh. Say, through the faith of the operation, lo, I am with you always. All right. So, you know, I guess, you know, this has been on my mind for a while, and I want to still think a little bit more about this killing them with kindness, because we do have weapons, but they're not 
carnal. Okay, maybe I'll end with that one now. Let's go get that one. <laughs> um, I think that's in, that's in a Corinthian too, but I don't know exactly where. Or maybe Ephesians. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. See, and, and you know, I guess it's just a, you know, the kindness ought to bring people to life, you know. I'm sorry. It's not exactly what you mean. But the pulling down of strongholds. Anybody have a, like a handy dandy little? That sounds like it's good. That sounds good. That's perfect. Second yep. Corinthians 10 and 4. Okay, just start right at 1. Okay. And then I'll, after Second this, I'll be Corinthians down. Corinthians 10 and 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Yahshua, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. See, that, that the point is, is we don't walk according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. All right? And he's talking about how people get a little confused because they're looking at him and judging him, in essence, after the flesh. Because he comes across being very meek when he's with you, but when he's away and he writes those letters, you're afraid to open them up sometimes. Okay? <laughs> Because, you know, he was lifted up to the third heaven, saw things that was, he can't even, couldn't even express because there wasn't an, uh, a witness here in the creation for it. Okay? And he, oh. go ahead. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after See, the flesh. See, the truth has made us free. We do not war after the flesh. Okay? Even though we walk in the flesh. All right, go ahead. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? but mighty through Yahweh to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, so you wouldn't think of like a, a weapon, kindness, that's not a, a physical weapon, mm -hmm. but the killing with, carnal, with kindness is a carnal idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is a carnal idea. Sorry. Mm, I didn't know if you wanted that. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Go ahead. So, casting down imagination. Uh -huh. Every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Yahweh. Okay, everything that what exalts itself what? Against the knowledge of Yahweh. Exalts itself against the knowledge of Yahweh. All right? And we've got a lot of people that are exalting themselves against mm -hmm. the knowledge of Yahweh. Okay? And... Um, this gentleman that came in, I mean, he was, it was a beautiful, you know, presentation that he gave. But it, and he did wondrous, miraculous works. Okay, not miraculous, I don't want to say that. But wonderful works for these people that were in dire need. All right? But at the end of the day was a knowledge of Yahweh poured out at all. All right? Made him comfortable in this creation. But we want to help people to be comfortable in the next, all right? Um, you know, and, but we started out, I mean, it's all Yasha was doing. Go ahead. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Yahshua. Okay, and it, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience. Okay, every one of our thoughts. Go ahead. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience uh -huh. when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay. And, um, you know, I guess that's, that's good enough um, because I really, like I said, don't have all that much on my mind. Um, but, um, yeah. Lo, I am with you always. And we have, we can go to the bank on that. All right. The bank of Yahshua the Messiah. Many riches there. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the time.
next speaker would be Dr. Sherry Williams. Do you like a water? Nothing. Oh, hey. I'll put it in my pocket. Your, yeah, pocket? put it in my pocket. Okay, Thanks. Right. Yep. Got pockets. <laughs> Good afternoon. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure, as always, to be here and to have anything to say about our Heavenly Father, you know. And I think, um, you know, a lot that's just been on my mind is like, you know, just um, so many things going on in the creation. And uh, I'm not trying to make sense of it. <laughs> Because there is no sense of it. You know, I mean, it's going according to Yahweh's purpose and plan. And that's the bottom line, you know, and uh, in that respect. But um, <clears throat> just thinking, you know, that how grateful I am and appreciative that Yahweh has shown me the things of himself that he's shown. And thinking, you know, how... You know, it's been a difficult time, you know, with this um, young girl's death, you know, on me. And I, I don't know why Yahweh put it so heavily on me, you know. I mean, I'm saddened and things like that. And I know we're not attached to this world. You know, it's not about this world. But it, it was, he really put it heavily on my heart and mind, you know, and... Um, but I just, um, you know, I, I, I've tried, and, and time is making it better, you know. Um, but I just think that um, we are so blessed where we sit and what we understand about our Creator, you know, as He really is and to actually exist. And I don't have really, I don't have a lot of things really going on. Um, let me see. I don't think that scripture reading, though. Huh? I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, let's get, though, um, I liked where Judith was a little bit there. Um, I think it's. I think it was in Romans, going about to establish, um, yes, okay, I had found it when I was sitting there, yeah, let's go to Romans, the 10th chapter, okay, uh, one. It up at one, yes, Romans yep, 10 and 1, Reverend. My heart's desire and prayer to Yahweh for Israel is that they might be saved. And that's been my heart's desire and prayer to Yahweh, you know, that there are those that, you know, might be saved even when they have not necessarily come into a knowledge and understanding of their creator. For whatever reason, Yahweh has it purpose that way, you know, that they had not yet as, as Judith mentioned, yet, not yet, you know, come into a knowledge and an understanding. But I think that, you know, I, I would speak for many that our desire would be that they would be saved, you know, and that, um, go on. Ten, two. For I bear record, I bear the record that they have a zeal of Yahweh, but not according to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we see that all the time with these mega churches even, you know, um, that there are people in there, not necessarily the ministers in there, because I think a lot of them have hidden agendas, you know, and it's all about uh, money, you know, and prosperity and power and wealth and things <coughs> like that. But some of the people sitting in there, you know, their hope and desire is to know their creator, you know, and, uh, and, and would want to worship him, you know. So they have, but they have a zeal of Yahweh. Go on from, but, not according to but it's not according to knowledge. Go on. Their own righteousness, 
have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of mm -hmm. God. For the Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses and Yahweh, Yahshua is the end of the law to everyone that believes. And you know, that's the thing that I am really grateful for because you know, through all of this, I never doubt Yahweh in any way, you know, because I know what he's capable of. And I think all of us can be witness to that. I mean, he's come past us about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So we can look back and see, you know, the things that Yahweh is showing us so that we really don't, shouldn't doubt um, Yahweh, and I know sometimes it may seem difficult to do that in this life, in this flesh, and having to deal with these people out here, <laughs> you know, and, and things that that could be a hard thing. But we see what Yahweh had done down here with the children of Israel and actually maybe getting into this Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, because it does talk about um, these were a stiff necked people stiff necked and this is for our learning for our admonition you know that Yahweh is showing us these things and in my uh, book here it says for chapter 17 the sin of Judah you know and um, so and then it goes on and it talks about the blessedness of trusting the Lord and the Sabbath must be kept these are all little headings throughout this chapter in, in my book but knowing what Yahweh um, had done for the children of Israel, we can feel, you know, and it's, it's, again, it's a hard thing. And it doesn't always, as Judith mentioned, it doesn't always feel that way. It's not always an easy thing, you know, to just kind of go along with your life, if I can say it that way, with the things that are happening. It's not easy to just always accept these things, you know, and understand them initially sometimes, but not to doubt any way. You know, that's what happened with the children of Israel when they went up into this land to spy out this land, that doubt. You know, after all that Yahweh had showed them, now we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You know, Yahweh has, how, how many times he's hit us over the head you've been in this class over 40 years he's still hitting you over the head you know it doesn't matter if you coming in new or if you've been here for years he's still hitting us over the head beating us over the head to show us these things and to prove these things to us that he is who he says he is he's going to do what he said he was going to do those promises he's the only one we all know that that he's the only one that can keep a promise because all of us I bet you there's not one person in here can, can raise their hand and say they've kept a promise all every promise they've made you can nobody can say that but Yahshua so and he's kept every promise he has made and so so the children of Israel didn't realize that. They didn't realize that. Yahweh made that promise to Abraham up here in the land of Canaan. And he told them that his seed was going to go down into a land they knew not of and be spitefully entreated. He foretold of all these things, but that he was going to bring them up with a mighty hand and bring them back into this land and just give it to them. And he did that. He still did it, even though they were stiff-necked and hard-headed, even though they trust... Um, they tried him over and over and complained. And that's what it's talking about in, in the 17th chapter, the sin of Judah. You know, and just that they had no faith. They had no faith in, and Judah talked about that, the operation of Yahweh. There's no, you know, we see the operation of Yahweh taking place over and over, <clears throat> over and over and over and over again, down to um, this very day, the operation of Yahweh taking place over and over. We have the witnesses. Again, we are compassed about. This hasn't changed. When the birth of a baby changes, then we got to run for the hills. You know, then we got to we got to do something else when that changes. You know, when Yahweh's um, when the when his plan, you know, or his pattern of salvation changes, then we're in trouble. 
you know? But until then, we can rely on the things that Yahweh has shown us and told to us. So the children of Israel, they doubted Yahweh, you know, and you see what happened. Yahweh killed them off out here in the wilderness of Sinai, you know, and so, um, so that they didn't go over into this land, not that generation, but the second generation went over. And so, you know, and so he's showing us these things again for our learning, for our admonition, so that we can build up that faith in Yahweh and not have doubts about whether things are going to be okay. They're going to be okay. Whether they're not okay, they're okay. You know, if I can say it like that. You know, I, I don't see any of us that look like they've missed a meal. <laughs> you know, I don't see any of us that seem to be lacking shelter or a job. You know, even if it's not maybe what you had anticipated at first, but he's taken you through that and you know that, and, and he knows that, Nick knows that for a reason. And going with that, you know, that he's taken him maybe, you know, and that's the thing about it. Look at the children of Israel. They didn't go through this wilderness the easy way. It wasn't an easy track for them to go because there was other ways to get to where they needed to go. But he didn't take them that easy way. And neither is he taking us the easy way. And it's sometimes hard for me even to understand why can't it be an easy way? Why can't he just make it easy? We know who he is. We trust in him. We believe the report. Why doesn't he just make it easy for us? Why? But no, because he has to build up that just like with exercise. You have to keep doing it. If you stop doing it, what happens? It turns back to fat again, right? And stuff. <laughs> you get lazy. You get complacent. You get, you know, and, and that's the thing he's showing me about this world. You know, it's not the hold on to. It is nothing. There is nothing to hold on to in this world, you know, and, and it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing because, you know, it's like sometimes, you know, I, you wake up, we wake up, I do wake up, you know, now that I'm getting older, it takes a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> I tell my kids, but I pretty much wake up in a good mood, you know, and, and I look at I'm optimistic about the day, you know, and I tell my kids that because my students, sometimes they come into class like, you know, they haven't had enough sleep at night. You know, they don't have bedtimes. They don't have, you know, curfews. They don't have a pattern to follow. And so they're all this all over the place. There's no stability. There's no consistency, you know, and so they don't know what they're doing. You know, they're lost. They don't know what they're doing, and they don't have, you know, the guidance at home or proper guidance, you know, at home. And so, you know, and I look at these things and see that, you know, what Yahweh, how it works for us, how, what Yahweh's showing us, you know, in that. We have stability. We, you know, and, phew, you know, we are blessed because... We have a solid foundation that has been built for us, you know, in this gospel because we look at the way things are now, there's classes that that doesn't matter anymore. And I was, I, I, I couldn't believe it when, when it was told to me. It does, you know, we don't care about teaching the name. You know, we don't care about laying this foundation. And that's how it was told to me. This isn't just something I'm just, you know, making up. That's what was said to me. And so, you know, how can you not? You would, so it just, <laughs> you bring a child into the world and then what? So you just, what, feed him meat? You know, a newborn child, and that's what it is like coming into class for someone's very first time. They're a newborn, you know? They've just come in, They're, you know, just coming into the world, if I can say it that way, and you can't give them hard food. You just don't do it, you know? <clears throat> so I look at these things uh, as we go through life daily, and just, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> am so grateful and appreciative 
to what Yahweh has given us. Excuse me, it's dry up here. But so here with the children of Israel, he didn't make it easy, you know, and um, but I want it to be easy. But I understand that it's not. It's not going to be that way, you know. But I still, all through all of this, you know, and Yahweh takes us through different things at different times, all of us. He puts us in that hot seat, if I can say it that way, you know, where things may get a little hot. We're in Florida. We understand heat, right? <laughs> it was 97 degrees the other day, you know, 97. I mean, that's hot. That's some heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we understand, you know, some heat from physical standpoint, you know. So Yahweh is putting us through that fire. And Judith has talked about that being tried by that fire, you know. And and <clears throat> but we can stand firm. And I think, you know, uh, that's what Yahweh is showing me. Even some of the things, you know, whatever you have on your mind, you know, and he's put me through a few things, all of us, you know, but he's put us through a few things, you know, but still always believing in Yahweh, you know, and not doubting that he's going to do because there's nothing to doubt. What is there to doubt? We know that he has promised salvation because that's his name. We know that Yahweh is salvation. We know he's made that promise, you know, and it talked about, you know, and it started up here, you know, with Abraham even making that promise, you know, um, and that it would be fulfilled. It would be carried out. And, you know, and I when I often think of um, what Yahweh or, you know, went through, and I'm going to say Yahweh in the form of Yahshua, yes, but what Yahweh put himself through, you know, even, it's really, um, it's, that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, to think that he would subject himself to this kind of torture, you know, to be beaten beyond recognition, to be scourged, to be spit upon, to be just treated. Uh, you know, the words are just not there, you know, but this way. And he did this for us so that we could come into a knowledge and an understanding and a trust, build up a trust, you know, in him that he was going to, there's nothing that he wouldn't do, literally, for us. You know, there's no, after going through this type of death, and I should be over here, but going through this, you know, type of death, we can feel rest assured that there's nothing that Yahweh wouldn't do for us. You know, he may put us in the hot seat a lot, a lot, sometimes a little bit more than we think we should be put in the hot seat, but knowing that there is life after death, there is salvation, there is hope, and it's not in this world. And I think that's the thing that he causes me to see and understand. And it's a hard thing. Again, it's not all just easy. I don't want to make it seem like, oh, it's okay, just easy and stuff. It's not because he didn't make it that way. And he showed us from the beginning with the children of Israel, it's not easy. It's not going to be like that. But we can know, we cannot have that doubt that Yahweh is going to do what he said he's going to do. He is salvation. He's given us this pattern and plan of salvation, you know, and we witness it as Judas talks about every day. Every he gives us little tidbits, whatever it is, you could be, you know, driving in your car and just the way the sun is shining. Even, you know, I'm looking at like sometimes I'm holding up my hand and I'm trying to block out the sun. But then I think, but that's representing Yahshua. You know, I, I don't want to be blinded and have an accident, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's representing Yahshua, you know, and it was talked about in Wednesday's class about the sun in the sky and Yahshua, 
being the son of Yahweh and how they're used synonymously at often, you know, and in Malachi, how Malachi talks about the son, or he referred to it as S-U-N, but he was clearly talking about, but people out there in the world don't know that. They don't understand that. They think that, you know, he's talking about this S-U-N in the sky, because that's what he put in there. But he was talking clearly about Yahshua the Messiah being the son of Yahweh. You know, and, you know, we have been, again, Again, we are, the, and, and that's still, you know, and I don't know, I guess y'all wants to keep us in awe of that, or keep me in awe of that. You know, I, I lay there quietly, and it's like, it's unbelievable sometimes, you know, if it hasn't been shown to you, you wouldn't believe it. You really wouldn't. If he doesn't reveal it and open it up to you, you wouldn't believe these things. You wouldn't believe a fish swallowed up a man. You know, you wouldn't believe that, you know, um, Joshua walked on water or, you know, you wouldn't. And, and to not just that, believe it. Even there are Christians out there that do believe these things but don't understand the meaning of them. That's the difference. We understand that it's not about Jonah. It's not about, um, you know, the disciples. It's not about Moses. It's not about Adam. It's not about, you know, Noah. It's not about them. But they're pointing to this is being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. It's all. They're all. All of these events are to bring us to a knowledge and understanding and to build our faith in Yahshua the Messiah and the operation of Yahweh. All of this is to build our faith in the operation of Yahweh. Cause that, and, and he's done it again. You think about what he has to go through to get us to understand that though. You know, that blows my mind sometimes, at the, the, the magnitude of what he has to go through for each and every one of us, and it's something different. It's a little bit maybe something different, but we all hopefully will wind up in the same place and the same understanding of our creator as he really is and actually exists. And the bottom line is to be able to give him the glory, the praise, and the honor, you know, <clears throat> for everything that ha um, he's done and is doing you know, for us in this earth plane. And again, you know, life isn't always easy. It's not always, what do they say, a bowl of cherries, right? So, but we take, um, we take what he's given us and l try to learn from it and use it, you know, to learn of him. What is it? And that's the thing that I think of when, when I am going through something a little more difficult than other times is what is it that Yahweh wants me to learn of him from this going through the cancer right away I knew it was something that he wanted me to learn of him not of me of him not that I could be this way or that way or anything it was what was it he wanted me to learn of him in going through that so whatever that's what it is whatever it is that we're going through it's what does Yahweh want us to learn of him in that process and it's something to make us stronger, to build our faith, to build our confidence so that there is, there can't be doubt in Yahweh. There's not confusion or confounded as it even talked about in the scriptures. Don't confound me, he says, you know. So, you know, and we know the world out here is confounded. They're confused. They don't know what is the purpose of this world or their life, you know, and we know that our purpose is to honor, praise, and glorify Yahweh. That's our purpose. We have to do all these other things in between. We have to eat. We have to live. We have to work. And I don't want to work anymore either, Judith. But, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but we, we do have to, you know, do all of these things. But our purpose is no longer predicated on those things, on just making a living, on just surviving, or in, in literally so, I should say, physically so, you know, but it is predicated on living that life after death, you know, and living in Yahshua and him in us. That's what our purpose is, to have Yahshua in us and we in him and have that eternal life and 
peace, oh, peace, 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 <laughs> righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit, you know? And, you know, when you look at that, and I think, and I don't remember the exact words of Dr. Kinley, but, you know, um, if we had a glimpse into the next age, you know, it, it would just be, you know, magnificent, you know, just having a glimpse. And we do have somewhat of that, you know, a glimpse into the next age. But, um, and that's what I think hopefully keeps us going, is knowing that there is something beyond this life, this world, you know. But again, just our purpose is to praise, honor, and glorify Yahweh through Yahshua the Messiah, you know, and, and be able to live in that righteousness, peace, and joy, you know, um, in the Holy Spirit. And I think, I don't think I really have anything else um, that's really been on my mind a lot, you know. Um, just, you know, of course, you know, stay in class, come as often as you can, and um, learn, take, you know, all we can. That's what Yahshua said, didn't take my yoke upon me, learn of me, you know, and, and uh, just stay steadfast, you know, in Yahshua. I'm not even going to say in the gospel, the gospel is Yahshua the Messiah, but in Yahshua. And with that, I'll just say hallelujah and thank you for the time. President of our Tampa branch, Dr. Cynthia Smith. Hand this to you while I clip this. Good morning. I mean, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, as always, it's always good to be in class. And You know, as the pre two previous speakers were admonishing us that, you know, y Yahshua never left his creation. And, you know, Judy brought that out so beautifully, how he says, I am always with you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything that we've gone through and everything that he has shown us, he has proven time and time again that he is still in his creation. And this creation is running according to his purpose. And there's nothing that's going on a whack, as it were. You know, it's not a free-for-all, even though people's perception is that it's a free-for-all. And, 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 you know, the thing about when you think about perception of how something is or or even the things that we see out there in the world. You know, we understand now that by us coming into a knowledge and understanding of our Creator as He really is and actually exists, it doesn't have to be a perception. See, we're dealing with the truth. But see, the world is dealing with perception. And the thing about perception is really is based on your own, you know, of your own the things that you've gone through, that, that forms your perception of how something actually is. And I was just thinking about, I thought about that, what is it, is it Plato, allegory of a cave? Yep. And, you know, just thinking about the word perception, it just came to my mind because in that whole synopsis is really talking about how you take someone from childhood and you put them in this cave. And within this cave, they grow up in this cave, and all they see are images that are, that's reflected based on the light. And from the images that they see, they decide what the image is. Not ever being witness to the actual thing that the image is making, that is being made from, wait. Not according to the actual thing that makes the image. And see, that goes back to, you know, thinking about that um, Hebrews, where it talks about the tabernacle being an image. And see, we understand that it's an image for something more spiritual. And 
you know, just thinking about the allegory of the cave theory is that you can grow up in isolation and it's not just about your own little area. And you grow up in this, you know, in isolation and what you perceive the world to be is just based on what you've experienced. And, you know, the, like the images that they were making that was being made while they were in the cave, they will say, is this. But in the reality, it really wasn't that. And the fact of it is that they didn't know the reality of what it was. And, you know, so that just, I'm, and that just makes me think that, you know, we're not dealing with the perception of something. We're dealing with the reality. Because with Yahweh, you're shown the reality of the thing. And you know how Judy was talking about how you have all these different religions, and each religion have their own God, and then they have all these steps that you have to take to, as it were, to be saved or for salvation. And the thing about it is that, you know, the world may say, oh, we understand that everybody can't be right. And we understand that there's only one truth. And see, it's not truth that's going to make it because we understand that one of the questions that um, Dr. Kelly had after he had his vision and revelation was how was Yahweh going to con consolidate the world if everyone thought differently? And we understand that our thinking and how we come together is based on one, Yahshua the Messiah. That's how we come together collectively. And, you know, because it... it um, goes back over there to say in um is it first Thessalonians five and twenty one? Three they bear record. That's John, John. Okay. First John five and seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Mm -hmm. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, mm -hmm. the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Okay, so those three that bear witness in the earth is the spirit, the water, and the blood. And they bear witness to what? To one. And the one is Joshua the Messiah. That's the one that they bear witness to. And we understand that this whole creation is bearing witness to him. So therefore, how can he go anywhere if the whole creation is bearing witness to him? Even when you don't see him, you see him. If you know what I mean, right? Because what did, um, who was it? Uh, Nicodemus? He said, show us the Father. And what did Yahshua say? Look, when you see me, you see the Father. And see, the thing is, is that he didn't recognize that when he saw Yahshua, he was seeing the Father. Because why? Because the world is still stuck on it being a trinity. And we understand that when you see Yahweh, see, you know, and some charts have, like, when you look at either one, Yahweh and Peter's spirit, Elohim or Yahshua, and some of the charts and other schools have all three names on one image, on each of the one image, because they understand that those three are one. And, and see, that's why Nicodemus said that, because he didn't understand that the three are one. And the thing about it is that even when Yahshua said... When he was talking, I mean, that's, the, that's one of the reasons why they stoned him, right? And, you know, because when they took him up to stone him, he said, look, why are you doing this? Because I healed somebody? They're like, no, you're healing somebody. That's a good thing. We're not concerned about that. He's, they said, we're stoning you because you're making yourself God. Well, he is. <laughs> Did he lie? No, he didn't tell them a lie. Not one time did he lie because what? See, we can understand Yahweh 
in pure spirit. And we always make reference to point that out that it's pure spirit. And pure spirit means that it's not diluted with anything else, right? If something is pure, nothing else has been added to it. So see, you didn't need Yahweh and another, another God, as it were, to make the creation. Why? Because he has shown that he's male and female right within himself. So therefore, he didn't need any help to make the creation. And so... But see, the pureness still exists. Even when he walked around, see, that's why it says, Yahshua came in the likeness of sinful flesh. See, and see, that's the importance of getting away from looking at something from a physical standpoint and moving on to looking at it from a spiritual standpoint. Because see, the physical will always trip you up. Just like that tabernacle was a figure of something to come. It's just a figure. Now, was it real? Yes, it was real. It wasn't imaginary, but it's a figure of something better. It's a figure of something spiritual because it's trying to show us something about our creator. It's trying to show us that we need to move from a state of physicalness to a state of spiritual spirituality or however you say it. I don't know if I just made up a word, but you guys know what I mean, right? Our thinking has to change. And see, we understand, you know, a lot of times we use, you know, we say the phrase, it's hard because we're still in a physical creation. You know, and sometimes I feel that we use it as a cop-out. Yeah, you're still in the physical creation, but see, there's no reason why the spirit can't take over. There is no reason why spirit cannot take over. We came from spirit law. Now, I was watching this animal show, and it was, um, the most, I think it was like the deadliest animals in Africa. And see, those animals, see, they don't have laws written down that the animals go up and read, right? They don't have that. They don't have the Ten Commandments that the animals go up and read, and then they say, all that Yahweh say we will do, right? They don't have that. But they do have spirit law. And I was watching this one instance where I think it was... Um, I think they were hippopotamus, and they were talking about how during the summer, when it's really hot, they stay in the water because the sun eats away at their skin, and they graze or eat at night because the sun has gone down. And it was showing how during the times, the dry season, which made me think about Florida, okay, the lake, or I guess it's, it's, I, guess it's I guess it's a lake, it's drier, so there's not that much water. And it showed like about 500 of these animals just in there. And you know something's going to happen because you know somebody has to fight for their position. So, you know, you at a, at a certain point, you have all this tug of war going on. And then they went on to show how, you know, and even when you look at the lion, how he's the head. And see, when another lion comes in and want to take over, he has to take down the one that's already the head before he can reign over. So it's all about they're operating on spirit law. And, you know, it just goes to show how you, you know, it just made me think about how sometimes animals are just more in tune than we are. You know, and we call ourselves superior over them. You know, but they're superior in a more spiritual way than we are, you know, because, and just like um, how Judith was talking about how the kids, they, you know, when they got to the chart of Judaism, that they said Yahweh, and it didn't even phase them, 
right? They just read the name Yahweh. Now, it didn't mean anything to them, but they're reading it. But then she was talking about how an early edition of her book had the name in it, and then the later edition, the name was out. And because parents, see, you know, sometimes, sometimes the older you get, the stupid, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? And, but see, but it just made me think about the children in their state and condition at that particular time was innocence. So that's why them saying Yahweh didn't even phase them. It didn't matter to them. Now, whereas an adult, oh, we don't want to say that name. You got to take that out. But see, what they don't understand is even if you take it out, that doesn't mean that it's not right. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. That just means that you are hindering other people from knowing. And we know that, that the Sadducees did that, right? Mm -hmm. When they talked about that key of knowledge. Mm -hmm. See, you took away the key of knowledge, and then you hinder those that try to go in, you know, go in for it. It's all over. That has been going on for centuries. So it doesn't matter. I mean, we have a perfect example of that with Jesus in the Bible, right? Now, the, the first edition of the King James Bible, 1611, there's no J in it. None whatsoever. I saw it. There's no J in it. No J. But see, along the line, mankind has added the name of Jesus in there, and then they're going to tell you this is the name of your Savior. But look at us like we're crazy, and we say, no, it's not. See, the truth has never been popular. And it's not going to start being popular. But see, that doesn't mean that it's not the truth. That doesn't mean that it's not right. You check it out for yourself. Because then it becomes a part of you and nobody can take it away. Don't believe something just because you want to jump on the bandwagon. Yahweh has never been concerned with numbers. Never. And I'm talking about numbers as far as people. We know that, you know, he has that pattern. And we talk about the threes. And we talk about the fours. And we talk about the, um, you know, the sevens and the eights. But see, that's for us, that's something physical for us to understand something spiritual. But see, Yahweh is not concerned with how many people are going to be saved. Because why? Because Joshua, it's already done. It's already done. Like I said before, the purpose has already happened. See, we're just going through it so we can learn something, but it's already happened. Yahweh said, look, I created the end right from the very beginning, so it's done. The, no the novel is write a novel. The book is created before it goes to print, right? When it goes to print and you read it, is he creating it at the same time you're reading it? No. It's already done. He already put the end there. Now, you can skip ahead and go to the end, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not going to do you any good. Because you start at the beginning. If you want to get some understanding, if you want to enjoy the book. But the book has already happened, right? Just like the purpose. It's already happened. And it's going according now to his purpose. Nothing is going to change. So it doesn't matter what you do. It's not going to change anything. Chuck can go stand outside naked. It's not going to change nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it might blind some people, but it's not going to change Yahweh's purpose. Because, <laughs> you know, it's not going to change anything.
because the purpose has already happened. Just like Yahweh slowed it down for Moses, and we were talking about this on Wednesday, the days of creation. Don't you think it didn't take Yahweh six days to do the creation? If we say Yahweh is all in all, then don't you think the minute he thought it, it was done? It was instantaneous. He just thought it and it was done. And he said what? It is good. So therefore, nothing needed to be changed. He didn't think it in... You know how sometimes we'll think of something and start doing it, and then we'll say, oh, no, I think I like it better this way. You know, you, you can do that with some recipes, right? You know, you change the recipe. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm going to put honey in it instead of sugar. Right? Or I'm going to put the Splenda, which is the imitation sugar, instead of the real sugar. Whatever. We do that kind of stuff. But see, Yahweh didn't have to do that. He didn't have to think about the creation and say, um, no. I, no, I'm going to change it. No, he didn't do that. When he thought it and it came to pass, he said it is good. And that's it. So all we have to do is, is say, it is good. Right? Because we can't change anything. So it has to be good. Because he said it was good. What do we always get? Count it all joy for all the things that we have to go through, right? And I'm just paraphrasing. You guys know what scripture I'm talking about, right? Now, is that easy to hear? No, it's not easy to hear. That we should be happy when we're going through turmoil and tribulations? Like Sherry was saying, why couldn't it just be easy? We all should be millionaires. <laughs> right? We have the truth. We love the truth. We all should be. In my father's house are many mansions. Give us one. You understand? But see, it's not like that. It is not like that. Because see, Yahweh didn't say, you believe and I'm going to make it easy for you. He never said that. And see, we have to realize that that is not the way it is. I'm serious. If anybody should be getting Oprah's millions, it should be us. Billions. Yeah. Oh, that, that's even worse. You understand what I'm saying? But we understand that it's not like that. You know, it's almost, it's almost the opposite. Because, see, he has to strip us of those worldly goods. Because we know that that's not going to go anywhere. He said, look, flesh and blood is not going to inherit the kingdom. Right? So he has to strip us of all of that. Now, see, he gives us a little to sustain our, like Sherry said, don't look like anybody missed any meals, right? <laughs> he give us a little bit so we can sustain that. The thing is, is that usually you don't get any much more than that, right? I know I'm in a percentage that's living from paycheck to paycheck. It is what it is, right? We're not hungry. We have a nice apartment. The rent is too high in my opinion, but, you know, that's just, I can't do anything about that. You understand what I'm saying? He has given us enough to sustain us. But at the same time, all the excess, he's cutting that away as we grow in the spirit. And see, we have to grow in the spirit. And that's why we don't have all the riches, all the fancy cars. Because see, then you have that. That's all you think about. That's all you would think about. You wouldn't think about Yahweh. Be why? You know how we are. When everything is going wonderfully, you, really? You understand what I'm saying? You don't, you're not going to spend as much time thinking about Yahweh. We're just not. So see, he has to 
change our thinking. And unfortunately, it is the hard way. You know, because sometimes you think about coming into this class, sometimes it's almost the opposite. It's almost what, what, worse. I, I didn't want to say the worst because I don't want to put that in the universe. You know, <laughs> worse. <laughs> but anyway, you understand? And I think it, I guess probably being in class just make you more aware. You know, because you were already going through the worst. You just wasn't conscious of it. And being in class and coming to a knowledge and understanding probably just makes us more aware of things that's happening. But it says, look, what? Count it all joy, right? We're going to be, what is that word? Oh, long-suffering, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Long-suffering. And the thing about it, even from a physical standpoint, no matter what you're going through, there's still somebody going through something worse. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody going through something worse than you. Yeah. So we do have to be thankful that Yahweh is at least keeping us in our right frame of mind. Because, see, we could be one of those people that say, I'm going back to the church. He could put that within us to say, I'm going back to the church. After being here for how long? And see, we understand and we know that church never did anything for us. You had the good feeling. But what is a good feeling going to give you? Nothing. Where is it going to get you? Nowhere. Good feelings. But see, now we can have the good feeling and we have the knowledge too. See, that's the difference. You have the good feeling, but you know why you have it. See, when I was in church, it was a good feeling. But I didn't understand anything that the preacher was saying. He could have been saying anything. And usually he was, right? How did I know that what he was saying was really in the Bible? Because we didn't carry any. And see, now you can read along. And you can verify what's being said. But just make sure that it's not your interpretation. Just make sure that you say that you're looking at it from what thus said Yahweh, not your own interpretation. And see, we've had enough of that out in the world with the interpretations. And that didn't get us anywhere. And see, Yahweh said what? Get um this is eternal life. Yes. You can start at the start at one. John seventeen and one. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. These words spoke Yahshua. Are you starting at the beginning? Mm -hmm. Okay. John 17 and 1. These words spoke Joshua and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. Okay, and see the thing about that, Joshua didn't have to lift his head up to heaven. Because we understand that, see, the world thinks that Yahweh is above the sun, moon, and stars, right? He was talking right within himself. That was just, go ahead. As you have given him all power over all flesh, mm -hmm. that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true Elohim, and Yahshua the Messiah, whom you have sent. Okay, so he's saying to get eternal life is predicated on knowing something. And what do you have to know? You have to know who he is, right? And that where he came from, in other words. You have to know that to get eternal life. And see, it's not that he didn't say to get eternal life is about a good feeling. He didn't say that. Right? He didn't say to blindly believe the minister. Right? He didn't say that. He said to know. See, he wants you to know something. And see, we understand that knowing... 
Yahweh no is different than the world no. Oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. You know of them. You don't know them. You understand what I'm saying? You know of them. But see, because it says Adam knew his wife Eve, then what? She conceived, right? So it's not based on just a casual no. Well, you hope it's not casual. You understand what I'm saying? You get where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. To know an intimate relationship. And see, that's what we have with Yahweh, an intimate relationship. Because, see, he has laid all his business out to us. He let us into his world. He said, look, my attributes are. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. Right? He has told us all that, right? Now, are we listening to that? Because when you meet somebody and you want to get to know them, what? They tell you their name. They tell you what they like and what they don't like, right? Eventually, you know that. If you're really in tune to that person, you know that. But if it's just something on the surface, you don't even care about that. We've been in situations where people didn't care about that, right? I hate flowers, and you bring me flowers. Because you like flowers. What is that? You, you understand what I'm saying? But see, Yahweh has opened up himself to us. He has laid it all out. See, you want to be about your father's business. Like Yahshua said when he was 12 years old, I am going about my father's business. And that's what you want to do. Be about your father's business. Because there's no other business to be about. It's all him, and that's it. And with that, I'll say hallelujah, and thank you for the time. Thanks, everyone, for making it out to class this Sunday. We hold classes here every Wednesday from 7 to 9, and every Sunday from 11 to 1. We will have a topic on Wednesday. It's up here. So let's all stand and be dismissed with a doxology. I think Joel should talk about, mention that again, because he just mentioned it Wednesday. Okay. Let me make a quick announcement. So, um... Anyways, on, uh, what I would like to get for our class, and I think it would be useful, is the 40-plate chart that uh, R.P. Kinley painted uh, under the direction of Dr. Kinley. And these can be purchased from uh, Los Angeles. They have two sizes. One is 22 feet long and one is 33 feet long. The 33 feet one is like 760 bucks. So I think we're going with the 22 foot long. Um, it's two feet two feet wide and 22 feet long and we're going to stretch it across the the top of the charts and it's three hundred thirty dollars plus thirty eight dollars in um, uh, shipping and so if you can contribute towards that um, I think it would be uh, a really good thing to have our class because on, on Wednesday when we were working with the days of creation I brought in copies of how those are laid out on that chart and it's really beautiful and it's really has a lot of information and it has a lot of other stories in the Bible and stuff that aren't on the charts that we have. It's a really, I think, a beautiful tool for uh, uh, getting into the Law and the Prophets. So if you can contribute, see Sherry. <laughs> okay, let's all stand and be dismissed. The doxology taken from the last couple, couple verses in Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say hallelujah. hallelujah.